Well, it's good to see everybody here this morning. Looking forward to our time of worship together. Let's turn in our course books to page number six. These are courses 10 and 11, page six at the bottom. Christ is all I need and under the blood of Jesus. Jesus Christ is made to me all I need, all I need. He alone is all my plea. He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness forevermore. My redemption, full and sure. He is all I need. Jesus is my all in all. All I need, all I need. While he keeps, I cannot fall. He is all my need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power. Holiness forevermore, my redemption full and sure, he is all I need. He redeemed me when he died, all I need, all I need. I with him was crucified. He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power. Holiness forevermore. My redemption full and sure. He is all I need. He's the treasure of my soul. All I need, all I need, he hath cleansed and made me whole, he is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness forevermore, my redemption full and sure. He is all I need. Glory, glory to the Lamb. All I need, all I need. By His Spirit sealed I am. He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power. Holiness forevermore, my redemption full and sure, he is all I need. And we'll sing number 11 two times through. This is such a great little chorus. Under the blood of Jesus, safe in the shepherd's fold. Under the blood of Jesus, safe while the ages roll. Safe though the worlds may crumble. Safe though the stars grow dim. Under the blood of Jesus, I am secure in him. Under the blood of Jesus, safe in the shepherd's fold. Under the blood of Jesus, safe while the ages roll. Safe though the worlds may crumble, safe though the stars grow dim, under the blood of Jesus.
Jesus, I am secure in him. And Roberts, coming to read for us. Good morning. Psalm 101, a psalm of David. I will sing on mercy and judgment. Unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. O oh, when th wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Whosoever privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that has a high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. I will early destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the word. Thy word is the truth. It's full of mercy and grace in Christ. Lord, we ask you to forgive us of our sins. Lord, we pray that we never look at other sinners and condemn them without condemning ourselves. There's only one perfect way and only one perfect heart, and that is Christ. Let us look to him today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. I don't know about you, but just listening to the reading of that psalm, I couldn't read it without thinking of myself being condemned in every way. And yet, where that condemnation stood against me, the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled it. And I'm thankful he did. We have our righteousness in him. Let's take our bulletins. And on the inside cover, let's sing this hymn to the tune of, O oh God, our help in ages past. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. A royal diadem adorns the mighty victor's brow. The highest place that heaven affords is his by sovereign right. The King of kings and Lord of lords is heaven's endless light. The joy of all who dwell above, the joy of all below. To whom he manifests his love and grants his name to know. Amid the splendors of his throne, unchanging love appears. The names he purchased for his own, still on his heart he bears. Love that expression, unchanging love, unconditional love of Christ for his own. And Aaron is going to come read for us. Good morning. Good morning. Galatians chapter 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith, for in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. 
I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross seized? I would they were even cut out off which tr trouble you. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, las las lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for revealing Christ to us in the scriptures, that we are no longer under, under bondage, but we live in the liberty of Christ. As Brother Ken preaches today and as he points us to Christ, we ask that you give us eyes to see, ears to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 488. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. I will tell the wondrous story How my lost estate to save In his boundless love and mercy He the ransom freely paid Sing, oh sing of my Redeemer with his blood he purchased me on the cross he sealed my pardon paid the debt and made me free i will praise my dear redeemer his triumphant power I'll tell How the victory he giveth Over sin and death and hell Sing, oh sing of my Redeemer With his blood he purchased me on the cross 
He sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. I will sing of my Redeemer and his heavenly love to me. He from death to life hath brought me, Son of God, with him to be. Sing, O oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me on the cross. He sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. Amen. You may be seated. Paid the debt, made me free. What a beautiful sound. David's come to read for us. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 12. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. And if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Father, we recognize through your word that we are sinners from birth, but Christ by his death saved us from our sin. Therefore, we should not be servants of sin and live after the manner of men, but live for Christ. Open our hearts and open our eyes to the truth in Christ. Amen. The title of this message is The Believer's Liberation Story. If you are a child of God, you have a liberation story. It's not one of how you freed yourself, that could never be, but it is of one how you have been freed by the Lord Jesus Christ at a great price. And that's what we've been studying in chapter 5 of Romans, what it took for Christ as the last Adam to come and deliver and redeem those who had been under condemnation by the first Adam. Condemnation and salvation are by representation. We've been condemned in Adam, and there's no getting around that. That's why we're sinners. We're born in sin. We come into this world from the womb speaking lies, what the scripture says. And left to ourselves, we could never be freed from that bondage. We would be forever under that condemnation. But now, enter the Lord Jesus Christ as the last Adam. And he came in order to deliver, to redeem, to reconcile, to justify, to pardon, to free. Those are all words that we've been studying. That people that God chose from fallen Adam's race gave to his son, and for whom Christ has come now and finished the work. I don't know about you, but when the Lord opened my ears and eyes to him and to this story, because I didn't know I'd been freed. I had been brought up under teaching whereby, yes, they talked about the grace of God, and they talked about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it was 
such as, well, here's what he has done, but now here's what you need to do. And as I listened to that, there was never any peace because I could hear what was being said about what Christ accomplished, but in reality, all the struggle going on in my flesh, it was as if he had done nothing. And now everything was up to me. But what a freedom when the Lord opened my eyes and showed me if he were to leave me in that lost estate under Adam, under that condemnation, I could never free myself. I might as well be down in a pit somewhere, chained to a wall without any light until my dying breath. That would be my end. But oh, to hear that he has come and he has finished the work and completed it. And by him now, those for whom he died, they're justified before God. That's when they were justified, when he died, when he finished the work. And sanctified, set apart in him. See, I'd always been taught that sanctification, that's something you do. Christ did his part, but now you better be working on that old nature. You better be working on sinning less and less. And I run into people all the time that tell me that that's what they're working on. And I'm asking them, well, how's that working for you? Because I lived under that bondage for years. It doesn't change one whit who you are as a sinner. But worse than that, it's a defiance of what Christ came to do. Because Paul said in Galatians 2, 21, if righteousness come by law, that is your keeping of the law, then Christ is dead in vain. It's as if to say, he didn't need to die, I got this. I mean, see how prideful that is to even think that way. And so as Romans 5, 21 ended, and remember these chapter divisions were put in here, but let's not lose sight of the flow. As Romans 5, 21 ended, it says that as sin hath reigned unto death. Well, how did sin reign unto death? In Adam. And any that are born in Adam and die in Adam, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ being their representative, having come for them, they will die in that reign unto death. But it says, even so might, what? Grace reign. Ha, huh, what a gracious word. Grace reign. How? Through righteousness. But now wait a minute. Not through your righteousness or mine, but his righteousness. His righteous obedience. Just like Adam's sin was imputed to us when he fell, so Christ's righteousness is imputed to his people when he obeyed. Not before. He had to come and work this out and offer to his father perfect obedience to his law and justice. But when he had finished the work, guess what? Righteousness reigned on behalf of his people. And there it says, unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. What a precious declaration of our liberation. That's why I call it our liberation story. When was Ken Weimer liberated? He was liberated when Christ died and rose again and ascended on high. I just didn't know about it. But any that have been liberated, they're going to find out about it. The Lord, by his spirit, is going to send this gospel. I don't know who they are. I can't even tell in a group this size. But the Lord knows those that are his. And as the gospel goes forth, what I've found is people will tell you. <laughs> I don't have to tell. I don't have to ask. I don't have to figure it out. People will tell you. They'll come up afterward and they say, you know, that was such a liberating message. Well, what was liberating about it? I took my eyes off myself and onto the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we find out about it, but, oh, this goes all the way back to the work of Christ. And so we come now into verse, or chapter 6 and verse 1, because this is often the question that people will bring up in objection to the truth that when Christ died, it was finished. And that it's by grace alone. What is it that they say? Oh, so 
what you're saying is that if Christ died for your sin, then you can just go out there and live like the devil. Just enjoy your life. Doesn't matter because it's all under the blood. There are some that have taught that. Even in the New Testament era, the Nicolaitans, you can read about it in the book of Revelation. There was a group that followed this man, and that was pretty much their thinking. Hey, you know, if Christ has paid your sin debt, it's paid. So eat, drink, and be merry because there's no more accountability. And so this chapter begins here in Romans chapter 6 with an objection that Paul knew and that we all know would be presented against the gospel of free grace. I always brace myself for it, especially in a group that's never heard it before because they're in bondage. They're laboring away like somebody down in a mine pit, just breaking rocks and thinking, I ah, gotta earn my keep for today. And all of a sudden someone comes along with a message it says, hey, what are you doing down here breaking rocks? Don't you know that this whole mine's already been paid for? And there's a table sitting up there for people to go sit down and eat. There's a shower. You can wash yourself in and you, it's free. And they're like, no way. No way. I, I've just got to keep down here, keep busy, keep going. That's what people do when they still have not had their eyes open. And there are preachers that love it that way. You know, preachers are the greatest controllers in the world. They like people under their thumb. And as long as they can keep them working and sweating and fearing and all these things, they don't want the message of free grace to be preached. I've heard it over the years. But this is the argument that you will hear. That someone would say, well, if we're justified... By the grace of God alone and justified already at the cross when Christ died apart from any works that we do, what is to keep us from continuing to sin or in sin? Here's where if this was an open meeting, I could open mic and just pass it to the different ones that the Lord has redeemed and say, how would you answer that question? No, sin is an enemy. We know it. And we have it within us. We have it around us. It would be like asking somebody that has been freed from a burning building that has been laid up in the hospital with the, with the wounds and, and scars healing to ask that person, well, now that you're freed, what's keeping you from wanting to go back into another burning building? They would look at you like, are you out of your mind? See, people that reason that way have never, two things, never ever seen anything of their sinfulness. Else they wouldn't be talking that way. That somehow, because of the free grace of God, then you're going to want to go back into that burning building and experience the burning all over again? No. But secondly, they've not known anything of the redeeming work of the Lord Jesus Christ and what it is just to be free to make to be made free from sin and condemnation if where our sin is the worst and our guilt is the greatest that's what we read up here in verse 21 the grace of God abounds even more and is is, is glorified not only in justifying us from that sin, but keeping us from that sin. Keeping us from ever wanting to go back into it and live a life of debauchery as we once did. And so, to begin with, sin of itself is never the cause of glorifying God's grace. You don't sin in order for the grace of God to abound. That's not why God has redeemed and justified his people. Sin is always the cause of wrath and judgment and condemnation, not grace. God has been pleased to magnify his grace. That's why his grace is declared in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that over and against 
sin, no matter how great the sin, grace that is greater than all our sin. That's the message of grace. And the forgiveness of that sin. Oh, how great is the forgiveness of sin. Grace is actually glorified in taking sinners from their sin and condemnation and who they were in Adam and putting them in Christ and thereby the work of Christ having been imputed to their account. They enjoy all the blessings of what Christ accomplished in order to deliver sinners such as we are. So that's what the grace of God does. I don't need the grace of God to give me a license to sin. That's how some people reason. Well, you're preaching grace. What you're doing is giving people a license to sin. No, sin doesn't need a license. It's within us. The grace of God is given that in spite of my sin and in spite of my sinfulness, I bow to his righteousness and seek to glorify him rather than the sinfulness of my sin. And so that's the first point I want us to see in this portion that we're looking at together. That none of us, if we're liberated, this is our liberation story, none of us that has been liberated by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ through his righteousness alone, None of us that has been liberated has been liber liberated to a life of wanton sin or wandering in sin. Think of that sheep. We're prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the one I love. But, oh, when the shepherd has found us and gathered us in his arms and brought us back to the fold, think of the comfort of being in him and carried in salvation versus what it was to be out there wandering in sin. Ask the prodigal son what he thinks of the grace of God. He didn't need the grace of his father to, to go out and live his life of debauchery in the world. When he came to his senses, he said, I would be better to go back and even be a servant in my father's house than to be wallowing around in this quagmire of uh, lostness. And so, that's the first point I want us to see, that we're not liberated to a life of sin, but we're liberated to a life of freedom. And this is what true freedom is. It's to be able to enjoy everything that Christ has procured on our behalf without ever having contributed one wit to it. It's all of him. I remember when I first got my driver's license back when I was 15 years old. And first time I got out on the road, I got thinking, man, it'd be fun to crank this car up and just go, even though the speed limit, speed limit side said so much. Uh, you know, just roll the windows down and let it fly. But I remember when I got the license, I remember something my dad told me. He said, now, son, this is not a license just to go out there and drive like you want to. There are rules, you follow the rule, and as long as you follow the rules of the road, you, you're going to enjoy the freedom. But as soon as you think that somehow you can go against this, you're going to find out that that freedom can be just as quickly taken away. And I've always remembered that over the years, especially with regard to now this matter of salvation and the grace of God that, you know, when people say, well, you're going to encourage people to go out there and sin all they want to. When I consider my own sin, I sin more than I want to. And that's what weighs me down. Even as long as, as it's been since my eyes were opened, I know myself to be a sinner. Standing here preaching for you. I know the sinfulness of my own heart and the sinfulness of sin. But my desire is not that the Lord take his hand off of me. And that I just go out there and live like the world. What is it that restrains me and constrains me? It's the knowledge that God has given me of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And to think that this sin put him on that cross. If that does not pull you up to consider that my sins nailed him to the cross. Why would I ever think then of. Wanting to lay it all down and 
go away. Our Lord asked his disciples as different ones took exception with his teaching and they went their way and then all of a sudden here's this little group around them and he said to them, will you also go away? Remember what Peter said, to whom shall we go? Thou art he that has the words of eternal life. To whom shall we go? Perish the thought. And that's really what Paul says here in verse 2 of my text. God forbid. I like the way it sounds in the Greek. Meganeto. <laughs> it's a strong word. God forbid that any should think that because of the grace of God, they will continue in sin in order that the grace of God abound. God forbid. That's an expression that is frequently used by the Apostle Paul in other portions of Scripture. But it's, it's to express shock and abhorrence. And that's what concerns me many times when I consider the sinfulness, sinfulness of my sin. That there's not more shock and abhorrence. Especially for one that, for whom the Lord Jesus Christ has paid to sin debt. And yet, you know, the love of Christ is unconditional. If the Lord were to judge us based upon just how urgently we felt because of our sin, he'd have to cast every one of us into hell. There's none of us that can say, that we've sensed the, the weight of our sin is God himself sees it. But I'm thankful even that is not a requirement in order for me to be an object of grace. In fact, more so, the fact that I don't sense the urgency. It's like with our kids. We're always watching out for them. We're concerned about danger being around. They're not. They're out there playing and having a good time, even throwing rocks at each other. I still have a scar on my forehead where a friend of mine, we each had our fort and we ran out of ammunition. So then we started throwing rocks and here come this rock over top. We had a wall built and everything. Boy, it hit me right over the head. Just about knocked me out. You know, we, we weren't aware of the danger. When the, when the house parents, because I grew up in a boarding school, when they found out about it, it was like, don't ever do that again. But that's the way we are left to ourselves. Here you can see where Paul says this question. And this is a good question. Verse 2. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And I know that poses then the second question. If we've been liberated, how is it that we are dead to sin? Because I've just been telling you it's alive and well in here. Well, the sense of... Here of being dead to sin, the first thing I know is that we're not dead to its influence. So get that out of your mind to think that, well, if I've been liberated, then I no longer have any more influence of sin in me or against me. There's another God forbid. It's very much alive and well. And that's how God's purposed it. In fact, Christ, when he prayed in his high priestly prayer there in the garden, he prayed that his own should not be taken from the world, but they should be kept from evil. So that right there shows the evil is present. And Paul wrote of that over in Romans 7. We're going to get to it eventually, but if you look in Romans 7 in verses 15 to 19. See, when people want to argue and say, no, if you're truly born again, you'll not, never have more influence of sin. Well, Paul evidently wasn't born again then, because here he said in verse 15, For that which I do, I allow not. For that what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Here's the part where you say, can I get an amen? Because this is, this is the way it is. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. I'm just consenting to the law condemning me as a sinner because I do that which I would not. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. The only way that sin is ever going to die is to kill this body. You know that? Until your dying breath, this sin dwells in us. And that's the way God's purposed it. You say, why? Well, 
makes me appreciate all the more my liberation from the condemnation of sin by the grace of God and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The more sin I see in me, the greater that grace shines and makes me wonder how it is that God could ever be merciful to me, knowing my sinfulness. And he says in verse 18, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. That's quite a testimony. And then you can read on all the way down through the end. So, to be dead to sin does not mean that we're dead to its influence. Secondly, to be dead to sin does not mean that we're dead to its presence. Over here in verse 21 of the same chapter in Romans 7, Paul says, I find then a law. It's just like you have a law of faith whereby God has justified sinners through the death of his son, completely, holy. There's a law of works that says if you violate God's law in even one point, you violated the whole thing and, were, and condemned, uh, worthy of condemnation at all. But there's also a law of sin. And here it is. I find then a law that when I would do good, get up today, nice cooler day, walk outside, sky, look up at the stars. That's for early morning risers, by the way. <laughs> just enjoy the fresh air and you think, ah, new day. Guess what? You've just wake, you know, awakened a sinner. And it won't take a millisecond before your mind starts turning to things that trouble you and fear and worry and all these things. You say, why is that? I mean, you could sit down and determine, I'm going to read my Bible today and may my thoughts be turned to God. And halfway through the reading, you have to stop and go back and think, what was I just reading? My mind wandered. I was starting to think about all this other stuff. That's what Paul's talking about. I find then a law. And if it's a law, you're not going to be able to undo it. That when I would do good, evil is present with me. So when Paul says we're dead to sin, he's not talking about being dead to its influence. He's not talking about being dead to its presence. It's ever with us. He's not talking about it being us being dead to its effects. It's like when you go out there and you till the garden and get the flower bed all ready and everything and plant the, the flowers. What's the first thing to pop up before the flowers do? Weeds. You're looking around thinking, where do those things come from? Well, that's the effects of sin over here in Romans 7 and verse 24. This is what caused Paul to cry out. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me, what, from the body of this death? And what's the one answer? He didn't say, I better get working on it. Better, better start telling the garden of this nature. Get rid of that sin. No. Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that with the mind I myself serve the law of God. In other words, in my mind... I know what the law says. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. But with the flesh, there it is, the law of sin. And that law of sin will hound us all the way to our last breath. So when Paul says that we're free from sin or we're dead to sin, he's not talking about being dead to its effects. In fact, stop and think about it. In the prayer that our Lord taught his disciples to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. What did he say? Forgive us our sins. I've had people ask me that. I say, well, if they're already forgiven at the cross, why do we need to pray forgive our, our sins? It's an acknowledgement of our sinfulness. And the word forgive there is in the present tense. So it means, as you have forgiven me, Lord, please Continue to forgive me my sins. May nothing ever be conditioned upon me. Because if it was conditioned on the Lord Jesus Christ, then therein is my forgiveness. One thing we know then 
when you talk about being dead to sin, coming back here to my text, when he says, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? This is key right now. So if you haven't gotten anything to this point, this here is important. We're dead to sin as far as its penalty and as far as its guilt. When we're freed from sin, what does Paul say there in Romans 8? There is therefore now what? No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Oh, take a deep breath. Wow. Freed from the guilt, freed from the condemnation, freed from the curse that I know I deserve. And yet, if Christ paid the debt, there is therefore now no condemnation. That's what Paul's talking about. And as you continue on here, he begins to talk about baptism. So here's where he brings it. He's never gotten off of Christ. Don't separate Romans 6 from Romans 5. We're declared righteous by the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is dealing with some that argue against that and say, well, if you say that, then that means you're going to go off. No. Such is the grace of God that taught you of the work of Christ that keeps you. And so he comes back to this in verse 3 and 4. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. So just as the first point was that sin does not give reason for us to, or the grace of God does not give reason for us to sin, here, verse 2, when talking about our liberation story, We've been liberated by the work of Christ. Not even by my believing it. I was liberated and therefore caused to believe it. And this is what Paul is describing here in these two verses, 3 and 4. The liberation that has come through the work of Christ. He says, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now when he says walk in newness of life, he's not talking to walk in sinlessness because it's already been proven. That we're not dead to its influence. We're not dead to its presence. One day we will be. Sin will be no more. In this flesh when we're taken from this world but for now to walk in newness of life stop and think about who that life is that's Christ and to walk in that newness of life is to walk in the enjoyment of who he is and why he came and what he accomplished and where he is now that's where our thoughts are knowing ourselves to be sinners so in these two verses, 3 and 4, Paul is giving a full answer to the objection set forth in verse 1 by showing that the believer's sanctification and the believer's justification, the believer's redemption, everything about the believer rests on the same foundation. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ and our union with him. Notice there are, the word that's used here are, is the word baptism. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. <clears throat> Some will preach this just as referring to water baptism. And so they'll say, that when you're baptized, and that word actually means immersed, because that is true biblical baptism, means to be immersed. Why? Because it represents being buried with Christ and risen with Christ in his death. And so baptism is so taught in the scriptures as a figure of what it is to die with Christ. When he died, those that he redeemed died with him. 
We didn't feel that death because he did. He bore it. And when he rose again, those for whom he died rose with him. But I believe here, when Paul is speaking of this baptism, because Christ talked about his death being a baptism. He asked his disciples, are you able to be baptized with the baptism wherewith I am baptized? What was he talking about? His death. Here was each one kind of saying, no, Lord, we'll follow you wherever. Peter especially. Prison, death, we'll follow you. The Lord pretty much told him, you don't even know what you're talking about. Are you able? No. If any one of us were able, then Christ would not have died. No, he came to die as a substitute. And I believe that's what Paul is talking about here primarily when he speaks of being baptized with Christ. It says here, we're buried with him by baptism into death. Don't think of water here, but think of being buried with him in his baptism into death. And just as he died, it says here that like as Christ was what? Raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. The walking in the newness of life is not walking in a sinless perfection. If that were the case, then we've all failed. But where he died, and those the Father gave him died in him, and he was raised, so we walk in that newness of life without condemnation. And we can say before God without sin. Why? Because it's been put away. Even though it be present in us. It is not being held to our account because when Christ died, he put it all away. And that's why in verse 5, he goes on and says, If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. I didn't actually die physically when he died. I wasn't even around. But when he died, I died. <laughs> By substitution, I was planted with him together in his death. And you notice how he puts it in verse 5, if we have been planted together. That word together is so important. It's talking about his church. It's talking about everyone for whom he came and paid the debt. This is why our liberation story, we've got nothing else to say than what Paul is saying here. And that is when Christ died, I died. When he rose again, I rose again. He was my representative. So that... If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we also sh we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. His death, his resurrection. That's the work of the last Adam. That's what undoes does all of the curse and the condemnation of the first Adam. That's how we're dead to sin. We're dead to its condemnation. We're dead to its curse, even though we continue to feel its presence with us. And Paul goes on there in verse 6 to describe this. Now, here's where some get sideways. Because, you know, when the scripture says, know this, it's, it's declaring a certainty. He said it, know ye not. So, the certainty is that when, if, if Christ died for me, when he died, I died. When he rose again, I rose again. Here's a certainty also in verse 6. Knowing this. That our old man is crucified with him. There's some that read that as being this flesh. The old man being this flesh. Was crucified with him. Well if that's the case. Then I would expect them not to have any more influence of sin. Because they've been crucified. Or not have any more thoughts of sin. Because it's been crucified. That's why I say it can't be referring to this flesh of sin in me that was crucified but when he's referring to the old man here he's talking about Adam everything that I was in Adam and, and again this is linked with Romans chapter 5 that even as by one man sin entered the world and death by sin so by the obedience of another many are made righteous this is a continuation of that thought He's called the old man because he is the oldest man to ever live. Adam. You remember? He's the first. 
but by his condemnation and sin, he brought condemnation on all his race. What's going to undo that? It's this crucifixion. It's the death of the Lord Jesus Christ taking the place of those sinners that otherwise stood condemned in Adam. And now that they live, and that's what he's talking about when he says in verse 6, that the body of sin might be destroyed. What body of sin? If he's talking about this internal body of sin that's in me, it hadn't been destroyed. It continues on. But the body of sin that was imputed to Adam's race, this old man and his race, that body of sin now has been taken off of those for whom Christ died and put on him. And he died for that body of sin. That's what he's talking about, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Henceforth, we should not be under that condemnation or curse of Adam. And I'm happy to stand here today and tell you, by God's grace and because of Christ and his work, I'm no longer under that curse of Adam. It's been removed. In fact, when you go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I know there's people ready to argue already. They're taking their pens out and they're thinking, oh, I'm going to be asking him some questions about this because the body of sin and Adam, an old man, that's, that's in here. Well, I want to immediately answer before you ask your question, how's that working for you? Because if Christ put that away, are you telling me now that you have no more sinful thoughts? That you have no more influence of sin? Some people think so. The way they talk, they talk. They think that somehow they're making improvements on that. He's not saying making improvements. He said, this body of sin, he's talking about that it might be destroyed. Either it was destroyed or it wasn't. That henceforth, we should not serve sin. That we should not be under that bondage of the old man, Adam. Well, here in 2 Corinthians 5, when he says up here in verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When you stop and think, old things are passed away. I'll tell you, there's still an awful lot of old things in here. What old things is he talking about when he says, if any man be in Christ as a new creation, is really what that word is. Well, it's to be taken from under the bondage of Adam with its condemnation and sin, and to be put in Christ with that justification that comes through his blood. That's how all things are become new. We're no longer under the law, but under Christ. And he says, all things are of God who hath what? Reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. That's how all things are new. I've been reconciled, sinner though I am, and given to us a ministry of reconciliation. So when we go out, we're not... Telling people, well, you better get busy getting better and doing better and being better and saying better. No. The ministry of reconciliation is to declare to sinners that reconciliation in Christ. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And when he uses that word world, he's talking about Gentiles, not just Jews. Sinners from every tribe, nation, and tongue. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. Why? Because he imputed it to Christ. There's where the curse is removed. Not imputing that to them. And hath committed unto us this word of reconciliation. Now, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ that be ye reconciled to God. What that's saying is quit fighting. Quit trying to figure out another way. Quit listening to these people that are trying to put you back under the law. Or... Some kind of self-help that you're going to fight your way out. No. Verse 21. For he, that is God, hath made him, that is Christ, to be sin for us. And that word sin is a body of sin. He made him to bear that body of sin. It didn't say he became sinful. Who knew no sin. But as a sin bearer, he took that body of sin on him. That we might be made what? The righteousness of God in him. 
It's not in my work. It's when he did. And that's what Paul's talking about here. And that's the story of our liberation. So complete was the work of the Lord Jesus Christ when he finished that work and cried, it is finished. It was finished on, a, on behalf of every one of those that the Father gave him so that it can be said now there is no condemnation. Now, if you're one of those, does that make you really feel like you want to go out there and live like the world and the devil? I'll tell you, not me, to know that he took that sin, that I might be freed, and to know that I stand reconciled before God because, because of his finished work. Oh, what a glorious gospel. And that's what it says there in verse 7 of Romans 6, and we have to stop, come back. But it says, for he that is dead... In other words, when Christ died, I died. He that is dead is what? Freed from sin. Freed not from its influence or its presence. We have that. But freed from its curse and its condemnation. Oh, what a blessed, glorious truth that is. But let's take our hymn books and sing hymn number 442. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O oh, earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Amen. All right, we'll be dismissed. Look forward to the next time, Lord willing.